What's up, everybody? DJ Bucky here with you. Hope uh, everything's going well on your end. We're excited to be uh, to be joining you here. Um, this is the time of year, Buck, where the draft's right around the corner. We've got all types of information out there, misinformation, if you want to call it that. Lots of stories swirling around about players, and mm-hmm. I, I will I will say off the top, can we? I, I I would as a PSA, don't get too caught up in who's visiting where this time of year. Would be my mm-hmm. that'd be my cautionary tale. Yeah, no, I I think some of that is it, funny because it's always the fascinating part, right? Uh, fans ask about the top 30 visits and what does that, that mean? Do people deliberately throw up smoke screens and those things? I would say not always, only a handful of those are fact-finding missions. Mm-hmm. Typically, you want to kick the tires on all the quarterbacks because that intel can help you down the line. Even if you're not, quote-unquote, in the business of getting a quarterback, if you can have a guy go through the building, you want to get all the intel because, one, you're either going to face him or down the line, he might be a free agent that you have some kind of interest in. So you want to have all the data. But when it comes to the other guys, every now and then you'll do it. But, man, 30 visits are not a lot of visits. No. DJ. So you don't want to waste a lot of them. But a lot of times it's either medical, character, or yep. a really a get-to-know-you session to make sure that you have all the background stuff completed. Yeah, a lot of teams or the, the, some of the teams that I worked with, we would uh, kind of identify, OK, these, you know, five to eight players, depending on where you pick, like our pick is going to, you know, it's going to be one of these five mm-hmm. to eight guys based off the guys you assume that are going to be gone before you pick. So you get those that clump of players and then it's OK, everybody in the everybody in the personnel staff is going to evaluate those five to eight players. We'll get a really, really good uh, uh, mix of opinions there. And then we'll bring in those five to eight players just to spend a little more time with them. But that still leaves an extra 20 spots, you know, 22 spots, however many mm-hmm. left. And you you hit it. I mean, there's guys that you have some you want to clean up medically. Man, our, they weren't we weren't quite so sure at the combine if he was a passable player. We want to get our doctors to get another look at mm-hmm. him. Or, you know, this is a junior underclassman. We haven't spent as much time with him. Couldn't go to the all-star game. Um, so we got a little bit of time with him at the combine, but just some character stuff. We want to just make sure we're comfortable with him. And that might be a fourth, fifth, sixth round player. And then they usually reserve, you know, just a few spots, maybe two or three spots for guys they don't believe are going to get drafted, but it's a recruiting visit, basically. We're going to try and 100%. recruit you to get you after the draft as an undrafted free agent. Oh, yeah, the undrafted free agent piece. Like, we got to start working that early. We want them to get comfortable with that. We mm-hmm. want to make sure we start talking to them like, hey, later in the round, like, hey, we late late round, day three, we're going to be thinking about trying to get to you, this and that. Like, but. Yeah, if, if for some reason. Yeah. We don't. Like, hey, what would you think about opportunity? Our guys have made it. So there's a it's a fact-finding mission at a bunch of different levels. And so what we're not privy to is we don't know which ones really have the medical stuff, which ones have the character stuff. And so. When yeah. we're tracking the visits, just go easy because you really don't know the intent behind why those guys were asked to come visit campus. And especially if you if a guy was at an all-star game, you you know, he, you had a chance to evaluate him at the school. You saw him at the all-star game. You saw him at the combine. He might be your pick in the top 15. With your top 15 pick, you don't necessarily need to bring him into the building because you've spent so much time with him that you're comfortable with him at that point in time. So there's lots of different layers to that thing with these visits. So that was just my cautionary tale uh, up there at the top. I, I want to give you one thing, then we'll get into some of the news, and then we're going to have a, a conversation on some of the top day two players that we like in this draft class. So, Buck, during this time of the year, one of the assignments that I have is uh, is creating these what we call baseball cards for the players when they get picked. So it's yeah. when a guy gets selected, hey, that they've taken this player, and then you'll see the screen pop up, you'll see his face, and it'll have three uh, little descriptors on there. It could be a couple scouting terms. It could be a comparison on there. But you got to go through and do that for the top about 175 players or so. So I've been playing around in the comp world, which is always dangerous, as you know. And then every now and then there's one uh, one or two that pop in your mind that we haven't had a chance to talk about. So I wanted to get your thoughts mm-hmm. on two. I'll say two quarterback comps that wouldn't be front of mind. But when I started thinking about it, I thought they were interesting. Let's start, first of all, with Michael Penix, okay? With Michael Ooh. Penix, we've heard Kirk Cousins uh, mentioned as a comp. Like, mm-hmm. uh, there's been some other ones that have floated around. I, You know, there's like some Ryan Tannehill aspects to him just in terms of being able to, you know, athletic, but not kind of a reluctant runner. Can, but doesn't necessarily choose to do it. So when I was looking, I was like, okay, I'm going to go back through my list of my Rolodex of players of like pocket passers with huge arms, right? Mm-hmm. That are, that are, you know, 
athletic enough to be able to go get some free yards, but don't necessarily want to do that. So I think people are going to think of this player and they'll think of the old version, but I want you to go back and think of the younger version of this player, Joe Flacco. Mm. Joe Flacco ran four, eight, six. Okay. Michael Penix ran in the four fives. So they're different animals in terms of like straight line speed and those things. But Flacco was a decent athlete. If, if you left him some really yards, he could, he could go get some of those yards. But what Flacco could do, Flacco could sit back in the pocket on his back foot and absolutely right. launch the football. And I think Penix, like from an arm strength, to how it comes off of his hand, like have you seen Joe Flacco yeah. throw? That looks different. Like the ball jumps. So that was my – and I know he's got six foot six versus six two. I'm just saying as a thrower, he Joe Flacco was the one I came up with. The arm, the arm talent is special. Like, and I think sometimes, DJ, I've been looking at all these highlights, right? Jalen Polk and – and then you're looking at Roma Dunze, and then you just you find yourself you're supposed to be looking at the receiver, but you're like, man, yeah. this dude is like throwing darts mm -hmm. left and right. I can see that because Joe Flacco's arm, having watched it firsthand last year, field level Cleveland versus Jacksonville, I'm like, I can't believe this dude is as old as he is throwing these BBs. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just tossing them. And what it does, it changes the way that you have to play defense. Michael Penix, Joe Flacco, you have to defend the deep part of the field because if you don't, they will take the shot and they will make you pay. Michael Penix has that. So I can understand from the arm talent standpoint and from a playing style perspective, like how he wants to play. He doesn't want to run it. You can see that he doesn't want to run it. Mm -hmm. um, it is something that like, hey, man, you got this other club in your bag. He's like, yeah, but I, I don't I don't I'm I don't not using that thing. Yeah. yeah, I don't I don't I don't use my driver. <laughs> like, no. I don't I don't use the driver. And so he doesn't he doesn't do it. But he certainly has that. But yeah, now he is a pocket passer and it's hard to find a real comp form because there's so few like the guys that would be your normal like in the last in our time like the matt ryan's the jared goss or whatever like his mm -hmm. arm talent is different he's got more you he's know? got more you know what I'm saying? it's, more, it's, it's yeah. different more power. so so it's so there's not there's not a thing and he's not he's not stafford you know what i'm saying so it's that it's trying to find that you just remember though like yeah. do you remember the super bowl year of flacco against the broncos the deep ball down the sideline um i don't oh, remember yeah. who it was it was the, the UCLA from ucla game. Yeah, I can't. Yeah. Why can't I remember it? Moore? Was it Moore? Uh, Raheem Moore. Was it Raheem Moore? Yeah, I can't remember. I, that, that, that's the name popping in my head. But I remember, yeah. do you remember that ball just launching that thing? And that's like when you watch Penix throw deep balls, that's the same thing. It is tight. The ball turns over uh, with beautiful trajectory. Like that, as a thrower, that's when that one came to me. Just watching Penix throw those deep posts and then watching that go ball. You are a scout. Raheem Moore is the name. UCLA. Is that who it was? Who it nice. was. Right, yeah, nice. for the Broncos. Yeah. Raheem Moore. Yeah. That's Absolutely. fantastic. That's a good poll. Um, so that's the that's the one out of left field comp, <laughs> which when it pops up on the TV, I'm gonna get crucified, but I'm gonna then hopefully explain it the way we just had this conversation right here. Um, the next one, and this is one that came uh from a conversation I was with Mina Kimes the other day doing her podcast. I think she's gonna come on ours here pretty soon. Um we were talking about how he was used, how Bo Nix was used and what he does. And I'm like, gosh, why did this not, why did I not come with this one? Like Tua. If you look at how Tua plays, quick hands, wow. RPOs, get the ball out, slants, hitches, ball's gone, lay it up over the top. Um, you know, just efficient, efficient, efficient. You're going to want to build the team. I think you want to build the team around Bo Nix the same way that the Dolphins built around Tua. Obviously, the left-handed, right-handed thing, but uh, but that was the other kind of outside of left field uh, comp that I had. Mina, by the way, she's going to come on with us April 18th on that Thursday, so she'll be on then. But what do you think about that one? I do like that one. I do like that one. That's a nice one. Um, I'm okay. I'm actually okay with that. Like that's 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 a pretty good one because Tua is another one who had the athleticism, reluctant runner, but it comes to dealing, getting it out of his hands. He certainly can do that. Bo Nix. Is an, um, look, he's an intermediate assassin. He does a really good job of working that 10 to 20 yard box, tearing it up. Uh, the IQ, I can, I can see from a playing style, I can see the similarities. I would say that Bo uses his legs more than Tua ever did at Alabama yeah. and in the pro. But in terms of playing style, yeah, there's some similarities in their playing style for sure. Yeah, and I think Bo, he didn't use his legs as much at Oregon as he did run around the crappy offensive line he had at Auburn. That was uh that's like the two different versions of of Bo Nix there. Um, but you know, I thought that was I thought that was an interesting one. All right, a couple a couple of things that have happened since we were last together. Uh Jordan Mailata just signed an agreement, three years, sixty-six million bucks. So the Eagles 
uh, lock down a tackle. They always seem to do these things early um, and they end up looking like good values uh, over time. And then mm -hmm. really kind of the big move. Um, how shocked were you when you saw the news come down that Stefan Diggs had been traded from Buffalo to Houston? Wow. Um, Stefan Diggs leaving Buffalo. So I, I, I kind of bought into the story that they were talking about throughout the season that, hey, it's nothing to see here. You know, he's a player that wants to be there. Um, he, he's fine. It's the, the, the beef between him and whoever, whether it's Sean McDermott or Josh Allen, is not that. I literally had just talked to one of their coaches, and he was like, oh, man, Stefan is fine. Like, you just have to know kind of how to interact and communicate with the players. It's not that big of an issue. And then we see it, and then Stefan Diggs uh, kind of responds to some tweets because people are like, ah, it's no big deal. Josh Allen can can – can move on without Stefan Diggs. And since Stefan Diggs is like, you sure? <laughs> <laughs> that he can do it. And 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 DJ, we we've talked about it because like the thing that that we have said and, and we know like when you have the quarterback on the young deal, like it's cool. You can go and spend the money and get the veteran receiver and those things. But when you have to write the big check to the quarterback, it now becomes about him elevating the young receivers around him. This will be the biggest test for Josh Allen and also for Joe Brady trying to craft an offense that is devoid of a true number one receiver. People are talking about the draft and they can find one, but let's be honest, DJ, it's hard to find a number one receiver at the bottom of the first round if that's where they use to the pick. And in this draft class, as much as we talk about how deep it is, it is deep, but the qualifications for being a number one is different than being a number two or number three receiver. It's loaded with number twos and threes. I don't know how many ones there are. I think it's going to be hard for the Buffalo Bills to fill that that spot, that number one role with Stefan Diggs being out the building. Yeah, this is what this is what I came back to uh, when this came out. I went back and looked it up. They lost Kansas City right in the divisional round. Stefan Diggs was targeted eight times, had three catches for twenty one yards. Um, mm -hmm. That's that's what I – and and if you heard uh, Bean, Bean had an interview the other day when they were asking him about what do they need to get over the hump. I think it was at the owners' meetings. And he said, we need our best players to play our best in the big moments. Ooh. And I don't know. I didn't, I didn't think anything of it when I heard it at the time. But then when, it, when this trade yeah. happened, I was like, let me go back and look at that game. Mm -hmm. um, and that was not – you know, it wasn't a great – it wasn't a great game there. And the numbers have kind of slipped a little bit. But I also think it's part of the bigger thing, which is just – we we say it. You you surround young rookie quarterback, rookie deal quarterbacks with veteran receivers, and once they once they grow up and you, the training wheels come off, the veteran yeah. receivers, especially once you hit thirty, we're gonna let them go play somewhere else, and then we're gonna let our quarterback, who's all grown up, make everybody else around him better. We're gonna go draft younger players. So let's think about this and how many times we've seen this happen, right? So you talk about Josh Allen now. We move Stefan Diggs away. He's gone. Uh, mm -hmm. We think about Patrick Mahomes and Tyreek Hill. He's gone. Let's look at Dak Prescott and Amari Cooper. He got moved out. They went with a younger receiver. I mean, if you go well, look through about it, look about Diggs, the first trade. Yeah, the I mean, Vikings we, moved on. They had Kirk Cousins. You know, they had paid him, and then Diggs goes to uh, Diggs goes to yeah. Buffalo, and they draft Justin Jefferson. Look so at what it, the look at what the Green Bay Packers did. Devontae Parker, like hey, uh, Devontae Adams. Devontae, Devontae Adams, Adams yeah. unbelievable player at the prime of his career. At, go we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna go with the young guys good. and and the other thing the number for wide receivers has kind of reached that mark where you have to make real real hard decisions mm -hmm. so it's one thing to pay wide receivers 18 to 20 million dollars it's another thing when they get to 30 million yeah. like dj 30 million dollar we talk about old quarterback money when you get to 30 million dollars you have to work man you it, look is is the juice worth the squeeze Mm -hmm. Am I really getting $30 million of production from the pass catcher on the outside? Or can I cobble together a lineup where I get maybe two guys that are in the teens making mm -hmm. that money, you know, to give me that kind of production. And if you believe in Josh, we just use Josh Allen. If you believe that Josh Allen, because they always kind of put him in the, he's always kind of put in the conversation with Pat Mahomes. Mm -hmm. Well, if you always believe it now that we're paying him 46, 47 million. Hey, Josh, uh, you you got to you got to figure this out. You got to figure mm -hmm. out a way to do it. Like you, it's time to it's time to take the floaties off. Yep. We're, we're putting you in the pool. And so this is a chance for Josh Allen to take his game up a notch. And before everyone kind of panics, let's remember what the conversation was like with Pat Mahomes when he lost Tyreek Hill. We were like, oh, my God, what are they doing? 
Mm-hmm. You got a talent, a special talent, and Tyreek Hill, how can you let him go? But they let him go and they win too. I'm not saying that the offense has been as good as it was with Tyreek Hill. But the results suggest that Pat Mahomes has been fine without him. His numbers have come down, but they've won. And so when you're building the team, you kind of have to figure out, I got so much money going to the quarterback, I can't pay everybody around the quarterback. The other side of it, though, is we talk about, okay, what these what these quarterbacks have been paid, now more responsibility on their plate. I can flip it around and say Tyreek Hill saved to his career, launched to his career. Stephon 100%. Diggs, Josh Allen's game went to another 100%. level as a young player 100%. came. Yeah. The Bears and Caleb Williams, they're hoping that, that Keenan Allen's going to come in and provide the same thing for him. Um, so, I mean, like we can – We can look at it. There's a reason why these guys are going to places with quarterbacks on rookie deals. They still have value, but you can't justify that value once you've paid the quarterback and now you have the receiver. And I would say maybe a little bit of an exception, Buck, would be because I think we'll see it, obviously, with what happens with Jamar Chase. He'll get get a new deal. He's not going to leave Cincinnati. I think maybe that second deal – and you're still in your 20s, you know, you can justify it even if you've paid the quarterback. I think once you get to the third contract, then it's like we can't can't do it. No, well, you can't do it. And you can't do it when receivers are over 30. And um, look, man, this is a baseball model, but baseball, they always talk about it's better to get rid of a guy a year too early rather than a year too late. And yeah. we have to be okay with that. And let's be honest about the Buffalo Bills. The Buffalo Bills have completely flipped and shed they're older players. The veteran leadership is all gone. Like they're not doing that. Tredavious White is gone. Leonard Floyd is out the building. We talked about Stefan Diggs being gone to cut Mitch Morse. I mean, they had got rid of a lot of older players. And at some point they were going to have to do that because now the way they have to build their team with Josh Allen making the money, it goes back to what we talked about. I can have the quarterback, maybe one playmaker that I'm paying significant money to, two pass rushers, a pick a second level defender to mm-hmm. pay, but that's it. The pie is only so big and everyone can't get big slices of the pie. We got to figure out a way to distribute this equally because we got the quarterback making so much money. We just can't, we can't pay everybody. Yeah. Another thing I would say is that, you know, Kansas city hitting on defensive players has helped offset the loss of Tyree kill. Cause the offense is not, as dynamic as it was, you know, with Tyree Kill, but they uh, they used that money, they used those draft picks, and they absolutely um, they absolutely nailed it on the defensive side of the ball. So, job well done there. Um, all right, let's uh, let's take a quick break. Uh, we'll come back. We're going to talk about uh, some some interesting players, day two players at these different positions. We'll do that right after this. All right, Buck, we're going to uh, go through these positions here, and uh, I'm going to throw out a couple names. Um, it's going to be this is going to be like a multiple choice. OK, I'm going to give you like a, a few names at these positions and just give me the one that stands out to you that you think when we look back, we'll say this is a, uh, a home run, second, third round pick. Right. Day two, rounds two and three. You ready to roll? Yep. Let's do it. All right, so if we're going to go quarterbacks, we're going to let's just assume that the big uh, six will take the big six out of the mix here. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to give you a couple names here, uh, and you tell me which one uh, you think could end up being a hit. Now, this might be more even to day three when it's all said and done. But if I gave you Spencer Rattler, I gave you Devin Leary, I gave you uh, Pratt from Tulane, and I gave you Joe Milton from uh, Tennessee, which one of those ones? which would be beyond the top six, do you think has a chance to be a starter and, and, and turn into something? Mm, that's tough. Right now, my initial thing, it, it comes down to Spencer Rattler and Devin Leary. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would say I think Devin Leary has better arm talent, so I'm going to go with Devin Leary. And I know that it's been sideways for him since he went to Kentucky, but at NC State, he was like a real dude. So I'm going to go with him and say that in the right situation, Devin Leary over those other guys has a chance to be a starter in the league. That would be a surprise starter if he came off the board on day three. Okay. Uh, I would – I would. they're touching each other. I gave them the same grade, so same two guys for me. Um, I have Rattler uh, just a, a hair over him, but I I could uh, – I could be – that's one of those I'd be fine with either one of them if they were – if that was kind so of – my- so my natural inclination was to go with Spencer Rattler because I felt like I've talked about him for so mm-hmm. long. But then I think if I am going to draft a quarterback uh, – late right that i'm that i'm gonna throw a dart i think i'm gonna throw a dart with a guy who may have more talent and normally that would lead me to joe milton 
But I don't know if Joe Milton can play the game like Devin Leary can play the game at the next level. I think he has extraordinary tools. I don't know if I can ever make those tools into production at the NFL level. All right. I'm going to give you uh, some more names at wide out here, Buck. And then we're going mm -hmm. to – I'm going to give you two options. You get two picks here. So give me cool. two day two guys. I'm going to read off uh, some names here for mm -hmm. you. I'm going to go with uh, Pearsall from Florida. I'm going to go Franklin from Oregon. I'm going to go Keon Coleman from Florida State. I'm going to go Malachi Corley from Western Kentucky. Roman Wilson from Michigan. Mm. Uh, Xavier Leggett from South Carolina. So those are your options. Uh, you give me Ooh. two of those guys that you that you dig. Ooh, man, this is a million wideouts, man. Yeah, that's a good one. So I'm going to go with Pearsall in the number one hole. Yep. And then I feel like the market is overcorrected when it came to Keon Coleman. Mm -hmm. Keon Coleman went from being the talk of the town, like the entire process, to now we don't even talk about him. So I'm going to go with Keon Coleman late, and I'm going to say that in the right environment as a big-body pass catcher, um, he finds a way to get it done. But he's going to be drafted much later than I think many people thought, but in the right situation, he'll make us regret the decision to not take him early. <clears throat> so there was a guy um, – that was mentioned to me by a, by a head coach, an offensive minded head coach of what he, you know, one of the things they were looking for in the off season, whether it was in free agency or in the draft kind of caught me off guard, but he said, John Jennings, John Jennings with the 49ers as that yeah. big, big physical slot because of what yeah. he does for their run game. And then yeah. also for what he does from a mismatch standpoint. And I think, you know, Michael yeah. Thomas is probably <clears throat> the original one there. Mm -hmm. Jennings doesn't get it the, the same targets uh, in that Niner offense because of all their other weapons. But he was looking for that profile of a player. And I thought, you know what? Keon Coleman, could he could be that guy, um, that you know, physical slot, if you want to use him in there. Okay, so you talk about Michael Thomas, but let's think about, like, the Saints going back. Marcus Colston. You yeah. remember how much Another Marcus one. Colston, big role played. Like, yeah. Keon Coleman can do some of those things. Um, that's a great comp. I'm going to use that comp, by the way, for my baseball yeah. card. I appreciate that. Yeah. That, that The buzz has come off his – like, no one talks about it. We haven't talked about mm -hmm. him. We've been on path all mm -hmm. week, haven't brought him up. But during the year, this dude made a bunch of acrobatic catches. Circus catches, and did all yeah. that other stuff. I, I think he's the one that was sleeping on. And you're right about the big slot receiver. <laughs> Larry Fitzgerald transitioned to that late in his, his career mm -hmm. because he could block and do that other stuff. Yeah, I think there's something to that for sure. I like it. Um, all right, let's go to the tight end position. I'll give you a couple names here, Buck. I'll go Jatavian Sanders. I will go with Theo Johnson, and I will go with Jared Wiley. I'll get you, those three guys. Give me one of the three. Okay, give me give me the three names. Who, who we got? We have Jatavian Sanders from Texas. We've got Theo Johnson from Penn State, and we've got Jared Wiley from TCU. Oh man, man, this like because. Typically, in these situations, the guys that you think are going to pop, like, athletically, it doesn't go. Because my natural thing is like, oh, man, if you can just get Theo Johnson to just blah, 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 mm -hmm. he would do it. I'm going to go with Sanders from Texas. Okay. Uh, look, when you watch him play on tape, like, uh, this dude just gets open. He catches <laughs> the ball naturally. He makes plays. Um, his production leads me to believe he'll be able to replicate that at the next level. Theo Johnson, I've never seen it. And it just makes me wonder, if we haven't seen it to this point, will we ever see it at a high level as a playmaker? Okay. Interesting. I, I would have, uh, <clears throat> I believe I've got Sanders there too. So that's, uh, oh, that would be mine. But I, <clears throat> I think uh, Jared Wiley's intriguing just because of the size, the length, uh, especially down in the red zone. He's a, you know, both him and Theo Johnson, big, big dudes. Um, all right, let's keep it rolling here. Let's go with the running back position. I can give you the pick buck. So i I'm not mm -hmm. going to even give you the names because I don't think any running back, nor do you believe any of these running backs are going in the first round. So if if we're going to say the bulk of these guys, I think go in the third round, make the case for one of them to go in round two. Mm. Look, I'm going to say this. I, I would like to think that Will Shipley goes ahead of that. Mm -hmm. But, DJ, when I watch him, like and I know a Will Shipley, Shipley guy. <clears throat> Which is tough for you as a Carolina guy to be all in like this on the Clemson back. It is, but you know what, man? Like, DJ, you know how we always do the thing, and 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 I'm always into the background of what man, this dude was a high level lacrosse player, right? Yeah. And so I started thinking about like the Chris Hogan's of the world, the other players of the world that have kind of played lacrosse and football. It just mm -hmm. kind of makes me think that he's gonna find a way. 
If I take him off the board, though, the guy that I would cast my lot with would be Blake Quorum from Michigan. Okay. And the reason why is I think from a running, just from his running style, DJ, I don't know if there's a more natural runner than Blake Quorum. His vision, his ability to jump cut, the way he slithers in and out. I know he lacks like all some of the things like we talk about, like the elite speed and all that. But in terms of just being a pure running back, Blake Quorum impresses me every time I watch the tape. I like it. Uh, we had the guy on I would pick the other day was Marshawn Lloyd just because – I like his. I like the 220 pounds that he brings. Yeah, I like the fact he can get through. He's got unbelievable contact balance, and he's he's just strong. Uh, plays big. Uh, I just like his profile, so I would go with. So it's funny. So, so so, and I can go with with both because with Marshawn and also with Corm, there is something too like the thick guy. I just mm-hmm. saw like on our network they just replayed a thing of like Doug Martin, right? Yeah, and I'm thinking about Doug Martin how. I wasn't in love with him when I when when I watched him in college. Yeah. He's fine. But then you watch him in the league and he has these 200 yard games and you can see the physicality <clears throat> and the size or whatever. There's something to the guys that have a little more <clears throat> to them in terms of running the football between the tackles. Do you know who my Blake Corum comp is? Okay. <laughs> That's so funny. I literally just saw that yesterday. And I'm That's looking it. at and it's it's a game. He's playing so right. He goes for 200 and something yards with Greg Schiano as a head coach. I'm like, man, like, I remember it. Boy, I was not like. He was just so strong. He was just so strong and tough, you know. It's the same. Blake Corm's the same guy. Now, Blake Corm had more juice before the injury. So I'm hoping that maybe some of that comes back a year, a year later uh, now, but just the same kind of toughness, compact, strong. Um, so that's funny that you said that because that's exactly who I have in my notes for, uh, for Blake Corm. Um, all right. How about. Uh, Let's go. Let's go. Uh, just offensive line across the board, Buck. Uh, so if I'm going to go day two, I mean, there's tackles. Uh, the interior guys, you know who the interior guys are. Let's say maybe Frazier could be there. Um, JPJ from Oregon could potentially be there. I think those guys probably go one. Uh, look, the the uh, the Duke dude is going. Um, he is gone. Um, um, yeah, he's he's I'm, going. He's I'm going in one. So those are the I'm interior thinking. guys, and then the tackles. Um, you know, people have different opinions on the tackles, but I would say Jordan Morgan from Arizona. You've got uh, uh, BYU. You've got the Notre Dame uh, kid Fisher. Like those are, you know, some of those guys. Yeah, I think Hayes from UConn to me is oh yeah, interior guy. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I think I think he's interesting just because um, look, and, and offensive linemen are really tricky because they really benefit from where they go in the system that they play in. I think he has enough toughness to go with just enough athleticism to kind of fit um, in the right system. I think he's more of a gap scheme player than a zone scheme player, but he has some of that mauler brawler to him that tends to play and play for a long time in the league. All right. Let's uh, let's stay on the, let's go stay up front. I should say, let's go to the defensive side of the ball. Uh, I'll give you edge or DTs. um, Any of them that you can go with here as a, as a day two player. (laughs) The DTs, like we'll see what happens with Fisk, Mason Smith. You've got uh, you've got Big Sweat from Texas. You've got Dwayne Carter from Duke, um, Chris Jenkins from Michigan, or Row 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 from mm-hmm. Clemson. Those are some of the DTs. That's, that's um, a great job. Edges. That's a great job yeah, for like all that. the vowels from <laughs> Thank Row, you. Row Row Row. Uh, Thank I'm going to go with those – Those are the DTs. And then real quick, the edge guys, uh, Marshawn Nealon probably goes in two. Braswell probably mm-hmm. goes in two. Um, you get into like Jonah Ellis, you get into Braylon Trice, like those the time, those types of guys. Um, let's go. Let's go with Chris Jenkins from Michigan. Mm-hmm. And he, here's here's what I'll say about Michigan guys, man. I'm telling you, DJ, my perspective on Michigan guys changed with Rashawn Gary because I used to be so hung up on the production and like, man, they should be able to produce more. Like, why don't they have more? And then he gets to the league and becomes a Pro Bowl caliber player. Uh, Chris yeah. Jenkins has. Freakish athleticism, even though it's weird because, like, he makes Bruce Feldman's freaks list and you see all the numbers or whatever, and then he didn't really dazzle make or impress at the combine. Like, di- didn't oh, do yeah. that. Didn't didn't even, didn't even show – at the combine it was fine, but it wasn't that. But where he benefits to me, he benefits from the family business. His dad, Chris, his uncle, Cullen, those guys played for a long time in the league. And so much of being able to play in the league is the knowledge and know-how I think he becomes a much better player as a protein was a collegian because he will be equipped with that knowledge in terms of how to survive and thrive 
inside. Yeah, I mean, he ran well. I mean, he ran four nine one at two ninety nine. I mean, that's that's pretty good. I think it's because maybe the expectation was he was going to re- like go crazy, I gonna, crazy. I thought he was. Gonna, I thought he was going to blow it. I, I thought he was going to do what Brandon Braden Fist did. I, that's what yeah. I was. I was sitting yeah. there like, all right, here yeah. we go. You're one of my guys. I got my little star on you. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but he wow. he's talented. Who do you think? Um. So when I look at those guys, if I was going to pick a day two guy that I think is going to hit, um. I, I'm I'm gonna stick with this this kind of I've been riding this train the whole time and that's with Marshawn Nealon from Western Michigan. I I just think that that rough rugged uh, profile I saw it with Tui Pelotu last year doing the Charger games that translates man I just think that um, you know power is in vogue right now as these offensive linemen do nothing but you know play kind of a finesse brand of football in college. You get you get a rough rugged 275 pound guy who wants to just go through your chest down after down after down after down. He just he beats people up, man. So I I liked him. I think he goes probably he maybe even goes in the early third. I think he'll go mid to late second to early third. But I just love I love that style. I think that plays well. The Ravens have well, made a, the Ravens have drafted this type of player every year. Well, look, I don't think you can ever go out. Of, I don't think you can ever go wrong with tough, high effort guys. I think they just kind of find a way to get mm-hmm. it done. And like for teams, and I mean, we'll talk about your guy later. I've never been more impressed with a press conference than Jim Harbaugh and the strength coach from the, the oh, new strength fine. coach for the Chargers. Oh, well, first of all, have I you mean, ever seen a strength coach press oh conference gosh. before? That's a first. DJ, it was like it was like catnip for a guy that like coaches guys. He's talking about like, hey, I gotta teach him <laughs> like how to break, like how to not break, like just you everything. No rod or you want to be a <laughs> <laughs> just everything and so dj and i think about that and you talk about baltimore and now i'm like okay the Chargers have one of those tough guy coaches and you know we like toughness plays and, and and it matters and i just think about all the guys you know when you think about like the max crosby's of the world where they're laid around guys but man their toughness and effort is never questioned when you watch them on tape like you never have any questions about how tough they are and how hard they play that goes a long way because i think effort is a skill it, it, it is a skill that we have to rate. So, yeah, I'm with you on that. All right. Linebacker-wise, uh, second round, third round type linebackers, you get to uh, – uh, let's go – I mean, I think we can really have your pick because I think there's a chance we don't have one going one. So that's – you're talking about Edron Edger, Edger Cooper. You're talking about Peyton Wilson, Junior Colson, Cedric Gray, Trevin Wallace. Um, mm-hmm. You know, that, that's a whole host of guys there. If you if you've got to pick a host of guys, yeah, yeah. Already, I said, already I said said that. Your buck, one of these guys, one of these guys is a Pro Bowler next year. Which one is it? Well, I mean, I, look. Let me take Peyton Wilson off because I felt like I've I've had the Peyton Wilson party for like last two weeks. So let's take him off. Um, when I look on tape and some of this is bloodlines or whatever. To me, Jeremiah Trotter makes a lot of okay. plays just on yeah. instincts and those things. Jeremiah Trotter Jr., he makes a lot of plays on instincts and awareness, and he just kind of has an innate feel for the position. Um, and as we always talk about, like so much of like success is tied to where you go and what style you play. DJ, I think if Jeremiah Trotter Jr. gets into a system that allows him to kind of do what he does best, which was see ball, get ball, like he did at Clemson, he's going he, he can be an impact player. Now we talk about Pro Bowl stuff. Eh, I put my Pro Bowl stuff on Peyton Wilson, but I think this guy would be a solid starter who at the end of the year, we're like, man, this dude really played really well for this team. Yeah, I would go Peyton Wilson <clears throat> too, as if I was going to say one of these guys is a Pro Bowler next year. That'd be probably my most popular pick because he'll make splash plays that'll get attention. Mm-hmm. Uh, what he does there. I think Junior Colson, just in the similar vein of David Harris when he was coming out of Michigan. So oh, like, yeah. 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 Inside linebacker, green dot, running the show. So, you know, make the call, off. physical. Yeah. Uh, and, and I like that profile. And, and and I think we're we're getting to the world. We've been at the point where you know what the Michigan players have been through. Mm-hmm. So you know when they come to the league, it ain't going to be too much for them. It's very similar to the way that we feel about Georgia guys. When they had the G on the helmet, we kind of know. We yeah. talked to Lad McConkey the other day, and Lad McConkey was just like, hey, man, the DNA, two-time national champion, all the stuff that we went through. Uh, I feel like when I get to the league, I kind of know what it's like to win. I feel the same thing comes with the guys in Michigan. Those guys kind of know they've been through it. They're tough enough. So Jimmy Colson certainly has a bright career. No, that's good stuff. Uh, 
<clears throat> All right, secondary. I'll lump them together because we're almost out of time. I'll give you your choice. Corners, safeties, uh, a day two player that you love. I, I told you the other day mine. So I, Max Melton's one that I've I've come up on, and he's my 50th player. Um, I just think he's somebody that could go middle, bottom two, maybe three, but somebody you look up next year, and all of a sudden he started 17 games and a really good player. Yeah, that's that's a really good one. Um, how about Javon Bullard from – uh, Ooh, Georgia, yeah. Uh, DJ, when we just talk about, and we, I feel like we talked about this for years. We, we, we kind of coined the term positionless football, and we're seeing so many of these DBs that play the quote unquote star position for their teams. Well, Bullet is one that has bounced around, played safety, played star, done some different things. That versatility is everything now because we're seeing people use big nickel, little nickel, safety plays high, safety plays low. Having that guy that has that experience, like a Bullard, um. He's going to have a lot of success. He's going to have a lot of success in a system that plays it. And I've learned a lot watching the Ravens and how they did Cal Hamilton and how they've done other safeties and allowed them to get going. So Bullet is a guy that I would kind of cast my lot with. Yeah, I like it. See, we've got some new names in there. Uh, fun to talk about those guys. Anything else you want to uh, throw in there, Buck, before we get out of here? I know you got to go do path, so i got to let you cut you loose here. <laughs> no, nah, like, DJ, this this is the, the fun time of year. And you talked about We talked about it at the beginning. People have to ignore the noise. So those who are kind of keeping score at home, doing their own uh, evaluations and those things, don't get caught up trying to chase the latest mock drafts. Like whatever you feel about a player, stick and pick. Because when we get to it and we start talking about these players in October, you're going to kick yourself if you change because you were influenced by the latest mock draft or what people are saying they're hearing. Trust what you've seen on tape. Put the pen down. Don't make extra switches and changes. The mistakes that I feel like I've made are the last minute switches <laughs> a week or two ahead of the draft. Like go ahead and stay true to what you believe months ago, because a lot of times that initial instinct is the right one. A lot of times I'll start with an opinion um, on a player and then, and then <laughs> kind of, kind of drifts and floats. And all of a sudden you get back to the very end. You're like, I want to just go back to where I had it the first time, man. That's, that's usually the best way to do it. It is funny because I've seen you have conversations about the Drake May thing. Yeah. I think Drake May, the conversation, it's, I think it's going to come back to what the mm -hmm. evaluation was, what we talked about in the fall. And people will look through all the other stuff. And at the end of the day, we're like, hey, whoa, 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 what, are, what are we talking about? Like, hey, mm -hmm. he's 6'4", he's 225, he's a good kid, IQ, this and that. Yeah, I know we talk about the production, but I know this. They don't grow on trees doing the stuff that he can do. Mm -mm. So I was it, talking it, to it. Let me get to it. Uh, on that note, I was talking to a GM about him the other day, and he said, look, I went and watched him play live last year, and I was like, this will be a tough decision, Caleb, Drake, you know, a year from now. And he's like, I can't, what am I just supposed to flush that out of my brain? Like, that's what I watched him play live, and that's what I thought. Like, this is, the, this is what you're looking for. This guy can do all that stuff. So, 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 so that's the thing. And I look, and I feel like as the Tar Heel homer, I'm mm -hmm. probably harder on him because I've seen every game that he's ever played in, yeah, you know? And so sometimes as an evaluator, you can have too much exposure to him. And yeah. I feel like I'm at the point where I'm nitpicking because the dude has talent. And we've talked about the things that you need to have arm talent, athleticism, IQ, toughness, uh, the ability to get along with everybody. He has all that stuff. So can I, can I, I just do one thing? Right cause I, I know we're going to leave, but I was going to bring this up cause I was looking at taking some notes from this conversation that I had, but, uh, on Drake, last thing on that, and we'll we'll wrap it up. But mm -hmm. one of the one of the things that's kind of annoyed me, I guess, about this draft process, but not maybe that's not the right word, but just mm -hmm. when, when we when we when you've heard this take, and I'm sure you've heard it on Caleb, when Caleb Williams didn't play in the bowl game, and Miller Moss threw for 300 yards and six touchdowns. So, what does that mean? Like, how did Caleb Williams? Why didn't Caleb Williams play that good? A couple things on that. Number one, that was a backup bowl. Okay. That was Louisville yeah. wasn't playing a bunch of dudes. No. Uh, SC was missing some pieces. SC put new guys in. It's a different. It's just a di different atmosphere. And if you're going to do that, did you see what Nussmeyer did playing for LSU in their bowl game against Wisconsin? Because I looked it up. I'm like, why is anybody talking about that? Nussmeyer was 31 of 45 for 395 yards, three touchdowns, and a pick. I'm like, it just feels like Caleb just gets picked on with that stuff. And then I went back and I was like, let me look at the let me look at the Carolina bowl game. They played oh uh, West Virginia, West Virginia. They could get a first down. They scored 10 points 
And the backup was 18 of 27 for 199 yards, one touchdown, and two picks. So I'm and like, was, if you're going to do anything with these bowl games, you ought to give Drake May a, a credit for being competitive with what he was playing with. No offense to your Tar Heels, but that was not a good team. Playing and, it, and, it, and it was all early. And I think the other thing that people miss, first time with a new offensive coordinator. So mm-hmm. he had Phil Longo the previous year, who Sam Howell had. So he spent two years with Phil Longo. They get a new offensive coordinator, new system, meaning new emphasis. And no matter what you say, air raid, whatever, like everyone runs it differently. I think he struggled with that. I also think that the part where people have to understand, Drake May has only played football in two of the last four years. Didn't play mm-hmm. his senior year. Only played in four games as a redshirt freshman. Didn't really play much because Sam Howell was there. And then he started the last two. You pointed out what he did that 2022 year. DJ, yeah. I, look, man, you just don't do what he did. 3,500 <laughs> plus yards, 35 touchdowns, 700 rushing yards, like 600 rushing yards, seven touch. Like the dudes that uh, – Kyler Murray, Deshaun Watson, Marcus Mariota, all those guys – and all those guys have played in the league. So he has special talent. And even the drop-off, when we talk about the drop-off, the drop-off isn't terrible. The mm-hmm. drop-off isn't what he was in 2022. Yeah. And I just believe, and some of this is clouded by the fact that in the industry and the business that we're in, everyone is looking for like the hot take for something different. Hey, I'm going to put Jaden Daniels number one over Caleb Williams. I'm going to drop this. J.J. McCarthy goes over Drake May. Whereas if we go back and we sit and think about what we really said in the fall, mm-hmm. what we said in the fall is that this is going to come down to Caleb Williams and Drake May. Yep. and. There are people that have real conversations about Drake May being number one overall at the quarterback spot. When he talks about Josh Allen, he talks about all that other stuff. I just think even for me, I need to pause and go back and say, hey, man, when we talk about checking off the box, it's not about production all the way. Sometimes it's the projection. And if we're going to project who typically plays in the league, the guy who plays in the league is 6'4", 225 pounds, big time arm talent, high IQ, who has athleticism. That would be mm-hmm. Drake May. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I just, again, this is just all off the cuff here. We weren't even planning on talking about all this stuff. But to me, my whole point was like, I just don't like when people use one cherry pick thing to try and. No, there's, but there's a lot of that, though, because because there's a lot of that. Because the other thing that is not true in the business as a scout, it ain't just the last season that they play. And I know yeah. I should have used. It's not the last, but yeah, yeah. it's not. It's the entire yeah. body of work. Body of the work. We're supposed to look at them the entire way and use all of that information to make the evaluation. Mm-hmm. So all of that comes into it, just like with Caleb. Caleb's freshman year, his sophomore year also counts with this year. So yep. all of that stuff has to be a part of the evaluation. It's not just the final time that we see him, because I had an old scout tell me, if they've done it once, they certainly can do it again. So that's 100%. why you got to grade the flashes. Yep. Yep. So it'll be interesting. I've had Drake going to the whole time and I, and I look all three of those quarterbacks are top six players for me. So I, I like all of them. I hope they're all successful, but that, I don't know. That's where I've been on that. We'll see how it all, how it all uh, comes down. All right. I, I kept you long buck. Appreciate it, man. Go crush it on path and uh, we'll catch up again early next week.